Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Daniel Pipes is the director of the Middle East Forum, a Philadelphia-based think tank. Currently the Taube Diller Distinguished Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He earned a doctorate in early Islamic history from Harvard University in 1978. The author of 12 books, Dr. Pipes also writes a weekly column for the Jerusalem Post. A Religion of Peace. Two quotations, Daniel. The first from President Bush on September 17, 2001, quote, the face of terror is not the true face of Islam. That's not what Islam is all about. Islam is peace, close quote. The second, Robert Spencer, in his book, The Truth About Muhammad, quote, stop insisting that Islam is a religion of peace. This is false, and falsehoods are never productive, close quote. In its nature, at the core of Islam, are we talking about a religion of peace? A religion of peace, if Islam prevails, then there'll be peace. But for Islam to prevail, will, will, has required and will require a lot of war. Now, I think it's not a good idea to try and define a religion of more than a billion people and nearly a millennium and a half in a word. There's been a lot of warfare in Islam. Uh, there will be, there is warfare, there will be warfare. Islam is not peace. And by the way, while Robert Spencer repeats that point, uh, President Bush has not. He was ridiculed for it, and he has avoided that kind of expression. Since yes, I did have to reach back all the way to 2001 to find it. All right. So <clears throat> let me give you another quotation. Raymond Ibrahim in National Review Online last May. Quote, this is a longish one, but I want to set it up and have you comment. Quote, the ideology of radical Islam, radical Islam, is grounded in a religion and a God, replete with eternal damnations and rewards, and thus not easily discredited. None of the Al-Qaeda radicals initiated the many commands that create strife between Muslims and non-Muslims. They only upheld them. Immutable verses from the Quran, as well as countless statements from and examples by Muhammad, are the ultimate source of this animosity. Close quote. Here's the question. You've said that radical Islam is the problem and moderate Islam is the solution. For a moment, set aside the political distinction between radical and moderate. Between the two, radical and moderate, who has the better theological argument? I can't quite answer that, but I can give you... You're uh, allowed to adjust the question <laughs> as necessary. I present to you three forms of Islam, All right. broadly speaking. Traditional Islam which was a compromise between the dictates of the religion and the practicalities of daily life. For example, the religion demands no interest on money. Commerce requires interest on money. Traditional Islam found a way to fulfill the letter of the law while in fact having interest on money. And then there's radical Islam, which is a 20th century phenomenon with earlier roots to be sure, but a 20th century phenomenon that is a transformation of Islam, the religion, into Islamism or radical Islam or totalitarian Islam, the ideology, an ideology comparable to fascism and communism. It takes certain aspects of the religion and takes them to the extreme. And then there is moderate Islam, which by and large is a hypothesis. It doesn't really exist yet. It exists in the minds of a few people. It exists in the practical applications of many people. But as a movement comparable to radical Islam, it doesn't yet exist. I believe it can exist. I think our policies should you be do. devoted to making uh, to helping it come into existence, but at this point, it's barely there. So I would rather not say which is more in keeping with the Quran, because I'm not a Muslim in the first place, I'm not a theologian. I'm not, it's not up to me to say that. But I can say with some certainty that the Quran can be read many different ways. Or to quote an Egyptian Go ahead. philosopher, the Quran is like a supermarket. You can take from it what you will. All right, so you see the anxiety that I'm getting at. <clears throat> the notion that uh, Islam arises in roughly 700 and by roughly three centuries later it's swept across northern Africa, it's gotten as far as uh, Paris, pushed back to Spain. That, so the anxiety is that there is something inherently aggressive and expansionary about this religion slash political construct slash culture and that whenever the West is weak, Islam becomes aggressive. Fair and you, fair that enough. is fair enough. Fair enough. As no, a historical it, point, that is fair enough. Fair enough that Islam <clears throat> has within it a, an aggressive quality. Jihad is the conquest, 
is the drive to conquer lands to bring under Muslim control. Uh, that's there. Now, jihad is there historically. What bin Laden or Khomeini have done with jihad is to turn into something yet more aggressive. A traditional Muslim would not have ex understood or expected 9-11. That wasn't within the definition of jihad. You didn't go to the enemy, to, to the non, not even enemy, to the non-Muslims uh, capitals and attack them like that. All right. The State of Israel. This year, Israel marks the 60th anniversary of its existence as a sovereign state. Let me hit you. This was, a, this was famous. I'm, as soon as I tell you the source, you'll know what's coming. Columnist Richard Cohen in the Washington Post in 2006. Quote, again, longish, but there's a lot here on, on which I'd like you to comment. Quote, the greatest mistake Israel could make is to forget that Israel itself is a mistake. It's an honest mistake, a well-intentioned mistake, a mistake for which no one is culpable. But the idea of creating a nation of European Jews in an era area of Arab Muslims has produced a century of warfare and terrorism. Israel fights Hezbollah in the north and Hamas in the south, but its most formidable enemy is history itself." Close quote. Six decades of the state of Israel, a noble mistake? On the contrary, a, a, a tremendous success. If you look at Israel itself, whether it be from the point of view of per capita income, scientific achievements, cultural attainments, liberal political culture, you see a successful modern state. The trouble Israel has is that its neighbors don't accept it. Indeed, uh, the range of, of assaults on Israel is perhaps unprecedented in world's history. Everything from weapons of mass destruction to conventional weaponry to terrorism to economic boycott to demographic assault to ideological undermining an extraordinary array of, of assaults, but Israel has thus far successfully withstood it and created something very valuable in the middle of a region that is politically very sick and very troubled mm. with Saddam Hussein's and Gamal Abdel Nasser's and, and so forth. Ayatollah Khomeini's, uh, there's nothing to compare to Israel as a bastion of modern liberal uh, uh, society. All right. Um, Let's work on the Palestinian question. <clears throat> Brent Scowcroft, writing in the New York Times, what is required is to summon the will of Arab and Israeli leaders, led by a determined American president, to forge the various elements into a conclusion, he's talking about a two-state solution to the Palestinian question, that all parties have already publicly accepted in principle. First of all, two-state solution okay with you? In principle? I believe there should be no discussion whatsoever of final status until the war is over. And the war defined how? Well, there's a war taking place since 1948, 60 years ago, in which the Palestinian Arab Muslim goal has been to eliminate Israel. And the Israeli goal has been to achieve the acceptance of Israel by its neighbors. And until that's resolved, while I don't deny that. Uh, in the basements of chancelleries, they should be thinking about this. There should be no public discussion of it whatsoever. One state, two state, no state. Not, not a fit topic for discussion until the Palestinians accept Israel. Now, Scowcroft is assuming that the Palestinians, he's looking at some formal documents. Mm -hmm. But in fact, if you look at any election, any survey, or the actions and statements of Palestinians, you see that overwhelmingly, by ratio about four to one, Palestinians do not accept the existence of a Jewish state. Right. And until that changes, I don't see any point in having any kind of negotiations whatsoever. Why is the, I'm asking sort of um, baby questions, but they're so fundamental that I want to hear you comment on them. After the end of the Second World War, <clears throat> estimates vary, but it's some tens of millions of people who are, is the usual 100 one. million, who are relocated. Poles move, Germans move, people are relocated hither and thither. Pakistanis, and, Indians, Vietnamese, Koreans. All right. And only the Palestinians remain in these squalid conditions right. in an indeterminate status all these decades later. Exactly. Why? The, Why is the political so? reason is that the Arab states at that time wanted to keep the Palestinians as a dagger aimed at Israel to keep this problem alive. The technical answer would be that in contrast to all other refugees, who are defined as refugees, the refugees defined as the person who leaves the country. The Palestinians were defined, the Palestinian refugees are a special UN uh, designation, and they are the person who leaves the country plus the descendants. Mm -hmm. So if you take the largest number 
estimated for Palestinian refugees in 48, 49, call it 700,000. 60 years later, how many are there left? 60,000, 80,000, 70,000, not that many, and getting smaller by the day. But the special Palestinian definition means that 700,000 grows into 4.5 million to 6 million, 10 million, who knows where it's going to go. Mm. Not only are the descendants of the refugees also considered refugees, but so, if, so are the children of a Palestinian, non-Palestinian marriage. So it grows like tops. Okay. Now, <clears throat> you mentioned that Israel wants acceptance by its neighbors. This, for me, is one of the great puzzles about modern Israel. Why? Why is it impossible for Israelis to say, we have about the best peace we're going to get right now. It depends on the notion that the IDF are, relative to their Arab neighbors, invincible, and that the state of Israel has the will to use the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, when it needs to do so. And that's about what we're going to have to live with for some undetermined period of decades. Why is there this craving to continue to probe on the diplomatic front after rebuff, after rebuff, after mm -hmm. intifada, after intifada? Why? Good question. Well, for 45 years, roughly, from 1948, the creation of Israel until 1993, the Oslo Accords, what you just described was more or less the Israeli point of view, or to put it slightly differently, deterrence. Right. We will wait them out, we will show them we're strong, we will punish them for transgressions, and we will just hope that one of these days the Arabs come to accept us. But since the uh, Oslo Accords, the dominant policy has been resolution. The, the first one was victory, and the, from ni since 93 it's to get resolution. Or to translate into policy terms, the approach has been appeasement. We'll give you something and accept us in return. It has failed. But the Israeli body politic, uh, has b lost its taste for going on with deterrence and is seeking to resolve the problem through appeasement. And although, as you point out, it's been rebuffed time and again, well, there is no taste, there's no heart for going back to deterrence. And uh, one watches an Israel that's drifting, that has really no policy at this point. Israel in peril. Henry Kissinger said on this very program earlier this month, quote, we may soon reach a point at which one has to come to two conclusions. One, that Iran is clearly going to go ahead to build a capacity that must lead to a nuclear capability. And secondly, that the present methods of restraining Iran are not succeeding. Does one then decide to go into a blockade of Iran or into real global sanctions or other steps? I prefer to leave that until we are closer to the moment. But we have to accept the fact that such a moment may be coming. Close quote. Has that moment already arrived? It's coming, as Mr. Kissinger pointed out. I'm less uh, cautious than he, and I would say that uh, we need to make it very clear to the Iranians, very, very clear, that should they continue down the path they are following, they will pay heavily for it. And I would hope that all those parties, the Europeans, the Russians, the Chinese in particular, who are loath to see an American attack on Iran, would jump on this bandwagon and make it clear to the Iranians that they will pay a heavy price. Thus, but Daniel, aren't you, aren't you outlining a possibility that has already been precluded? We know the Russians aren't going to jump on the bandwagon. Well, but if we can... We know the Europeans have no enthusiasm, no, but, for, don't we? Uh, but <clears throat> what do they most dread? They most dread an American attack. I think it should be possible to say, look, if you don't want an American attack, then you have to join us in being very serious uh, with the Iranians and making it clear to them that we will attack if they don't stop. In other words, the ideal resolution is for the Iranians themselves to close down this project, not for us to do it. For right, them. right. And I think the only realistic way of doing that is to have everyone convey the message to Tehran that watch out, uh, you're going to pay heavily in terms of security, in terms of the economy. And you think that and there's a realistic happening. prospect that in the waning eight and a half months of the Bush administration, I don't see it happening. You don't? No, no, no. I mean, that's what I'd like to see. What I suspect will be the case is that sh should the Democratic nominee win in November, uh, President Bush will do something. And should it be Mr. McCain who wins, he'll punt and let McCain decide what to do. Well, let me give you then the, the, the Krauthammer option. Charles Krauthammer, April 11, 2008, in the Washington Post, he says, in effect, it's over. The Bush administration is not going to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear capability. So what it should do is issue the following statement. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear attack upon Israel by Iran or originating in Iran as an attack by Iran on the United States. 
In other words, offer the same nuclear guarantee to Israel that we offered to, that we still, it's still on the books, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the NATO alliance. Right. I don't see any, I, I disagree. You do. On the one hand, I don't see any reason to, to decide in the spring that uh, President Bush will not act in the next, what, eight months, seven months. I, I just don't see on what basis one draws that conclusion. Uh, and secondly, uh, the Israelis are quite competent to take care of themselves. Uh, oh, study, right. Studies show that were there to be a nuclear exchange, the number of Israelis killed, while it's a very large and serious number for Israel, would be paltry compared to the number of Iranians killed. Their Israeli nuclear capability is substantial. All right, let me ask you another question about the, the Israeli capability. So in other words, in terms of deterrence, the Israelis... They're already in good shape. Yeah. All right. And Ch they're making it clear. Uh, a, a minister in the government a few days ago made a statement to the Iranians, watch out, we'll wipe you out if you try to do anything towards us. Does it make sense for Israel to be much more pu public about its nuclear capability during the Cold War, quite down to quite a low level of detail, raw data about wh what we had was known publicly because we wanted it known publicly. So and so many MIRVs and such and such an arsenal, should they do that? The Israeli policy has been for 50 years now to be very secretive about their nuclear capabilities. I think that is an outdated policy. You do. It probably would make sense for them to boast about it a bit at this point. July 7th, 1981, Israeli fighter jets take out the nuclear reactor at Osirik, 11 miles outside Baghdad. And we now know that in September of 2007, the Israelis destroy a nuclear reactor in Syria that the North Koreans were helping to build in Syria. <clears throat> Does Israel have the capacity to cripple, let's, put, let's, let's make this the weak formulation, to delay uh, the Iranians in acquiring a nuclear capability? It appears they do. There are three routes they could take. A northern route via the Turkish-Syrian border, a central route across Jordan and Iraq, and a southern route uh, via the Jordanian... You're talking about border. air routes? Yeah. Right, all right. Uh, the middle one is actually the most interesting because it would require getting permission from the United States. Who knows? Uh, it would probably take on the order of 25... Uh, F-15s and 25 F-16s, it would take the kind of... Combined, uh, you're talking right, total force 50, of 50. 50. 50. It yeah. would take uh, the kind of ordnance that we have been supplying to the Israelis. It would require a high degree of intelligence, which presumably they have, and probably would require uh, striking three targets in Isfahan and Iraq and Natanz. And studies based on public information suggest that while this would not be a foregone conclusion, as it would be in the case of the United States, right. uh, there's a pretty good chance that the Israelis could pull it off. Let me ask you one final question about this Iran and Israel and the United States. As between, I'm not even sure how to formulate this, so I'll, I'll ask you the question and you feel free to reformulate it if you'd like to, but what I'm getting at is, as between a greater American role in protecting Israel and a greater Israeli role in protecting Israel, that, or, or let's say you had a choice between President Bush taking out the nuclear capability in Iran and the Israelis doing so for themselves. Which do you prefer? Which is better for the United States and which is better for Israel over the longer term? I'd rather see the United States do it. Why is and that? that this is not a uniquely Israeli problem. Mm. This is a problem from many points of view. For example, it's a problem that uh, the, if the Iranians do build and weaponize their nuclear uh, weapons, they would then be breaking the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in a way that has not been done before and would be a signal to others that you can do it freely as well. That's not an Israeli issue particularly. Right. Uh, I also think we have much greater capabilities. And I also think that the uh, September Israeli raid on Syria presents a very interesting opportunity. What if we do something similar? Quietly go in, blow a few things up, don't declare anything to the outside world? Let the Iranians make a difficult choice. Do they acknowledge that they've had these facilities destroyed? Or do they go quiet, as the Syrians did? The politics of Israel and the United States. This year, the Bush administration requested $2.5 billion in aid for Israel, more than double the $1.1 billion it requested for Afghanistan. Israel is a rich country. We opened this interview by talking about what a miracle the state of Israel is after six decades. The prosperity, the technical prowess. Afghanistan is a poor country. Why should we support Israel at such high levels? And why should we support Afghanistan at such a high level as well? Uh, I'm against it. 
I think that this aid now at such a high level since 1980 is a mistake. Uh, it is very costly to Israel. 1980 because of the Camp David Accord, right. right. Uh, it is costly to Israel in terms of public opinion in this country, which, which is resentful, mm. in terms of the inevitable um, implications of getting aid, which are negative for Israel. Uh, that I, is to I, say they become, to some extent, a client state. Are you talking about the psych psychological effect on Israeli well, psychological, public? Psychological, The sense of dependency? Governmental. Right. It just is not a good thing. I believe in foreign aid for two purposes, and neither Israel nor Afghanistan fit that definition, or those two definitions. One would be emergency, um, blankets and soup. Humanitarian aid. Yeah, when there's some disaster, you come in and you All help right. people. The tsunami. Right. All right. And the second is, to put it brutally, uh, to bribe. When we want to get something, and the way to get it is to pay for it. But I don't believe in development aid. I don't believe in military aid over the long term. Military aid on an emergency basis, perhaps. But I don't believe in it. I don't think it's good for us. I don't think it's good for the recipients. All right. I'm trying to think where this is going to be more unpopular, certain <laughs> corridors in Washington or certain in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Um, the now notorious John Mearsheimer and Stephen Walt writing in their recent book, The Israel Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy, quote, Support for Israel is undermining relations with other U.S. allies, helping inspire a generation of anti-American extremists, and complicating U.S. efforts to deal with a volatile but vital region. I'll give you plenty of time to knock down the premise if you'd like to, but here's the question, or another piece of the premise. In short, the largely unconditional special relationship between the United States and Israel is no longer defensible on strategic grounds, close quote. As I said, they're notorious, and I know you have opinions about them, and I want to uh, feel free. But they're getting at something, which is realpolitik time. What's in it for us? Why is it in the interest of the United States to have such a close relationship with Israel? Walter Mearsheimer have a, out, well, a, a, a somewhat primitive point of view that goes back to the 1950s, when there was an assumption that either you're with the Israelis or with, you're with the Arabs. Mm -hmm. It's zero sum. If you're friendly with Israel, you lose the Arabs. What became clear in the course of the 70s and later decades is that you can have both. In fact, you are stronger by virtue of having good relations with Israel, both in a military sense, and you've got this powerful allied state that brings many benefits to you, and also in a political, diplomatic sense, in that you can influence the most powerful actor in the region. And we have benefited from that. So uh, this notion that the better your Israel ties are, the worse your Arab ties are, is primitive and in, inaccurate. We have flourished by having both. We are all the stronger for having good ties with both sides. All right. What would happen, <clears throat> one hears this again and again, although it tends to be sub rosa because it's so, uh, it's not politically incorrect, but it's incorrect. The notion that if only we backed away from Israel, suddenly things would get better between us and the Arabs. Give me the scenario if we did back away, we reduced aid, um, we took various steps, we, we visibly placed greater pressure on Israel to do what various Arab nations want us to do with regard to the Palestinians, although I know the aims there and desires are conflicting. Mm -hmm. But play out how we would be weaker if we backed away from Israel. It would be weaker in two senses. Mm -hmm. First, our standing in the Arab world would go down because we would lose influence in Israel. And secondly... I was, explain that. Well, as I just suggested before, our influence over Israel is a source of strength vis-a-vis -vis the Arabs. All right. And secondly, uh, we would be weaker in a sense that if the Israelis withdrew from the West Bank and if they went back to the 4th of June 1967 boundaries and so forth, it would incite the Palestinians and others to expect more. In other words, were the Israelis to go back to those 67 borders, there are two possible responses. One is the Arabs say, oh, thank you, very sporting, we're grateful, we're not going to leave you alone. Or, I think far more likely, oh, we're winning, we're on a roll, uh, we've got Lebanon, Gaza, West Bank, now let's get Jerusalem, and then Haifa, and then Tel Aviv, and no more Israel. And okay. that, I think, would be detrimental to our interests in every possible way. We don't want to see the 
hot war, Arab hot war against Israel uh, take place. We want it to settle down and be resolved. Uh, we've been talking about the present moment. Let's, take the, let's talk about decades, several topics. Europe. The Muslim proportion of the population in Europe is growing. <clears throat> Amsterdam is likely to become majority Muslim by 2015. Russia, from the Urals to the Pacific, majority Muslim by 2050. You see three alternatives, and I'd, I'd like to go quickly through all three. It's television, so we'll, we'll talk about the rise and fall of empires in 90 seconds, please. You give me the odds. First, indigenous Europeans and immigrant Muslims find a way to give, live together in harmony. How likely? Five percent. All right. Second, Europe comes to be dominated by the Muslim religion and culture becoming Eurabia, in effect a part of the Muslim world. Forty-seven and a half percent. Oh, that's the likeliest. Well, no, the other one's forty-seven and a half percent too. Oh, I see. All right. The, <laughs> the third possibility is that Europeans who still make up 95 percent of the population, I'm quoting you directly, they can at any time reassert control should they see Muslims posing a threat to a valued way of life, close quote. That's in other words, I, I can't choose between those latter two. But you do consider it likely that Europeans might in some way or another reassert control uh, over the co indigenous re Europeans. I think that's as likely as there's simply continuing the trends of the last five decades. If you look out ten, two, three decades, and you, your two likeliest alternatives, Muslims become dominant or Europeans reassert their own culture? Leading to civil strife. That's the question. Both of those are likely to involve civil strife or not. If the, con if the current trends continue, there need not be civil strife. One just has a quiet transformation of the continent into what some people are calling Arabia. Uh, I see. All right, Europeans so just go quietly into this new, new order with uh, Sharia and Islamic domination. But if the Europeans reassert themselves, I think it's likely that, that there will be strife. Yeah. And I think the French riots of October, November 2005 are a precursor of what it might look like. Those were not particularly uh, lethal. And future ones were probably more lethal, but this widespread violence and assertion. So we have already reached a point at which if the basket of countries that has represented our closest allies since the, certainly in the last five decades, if the basket of countries in Europe wish to reassert European political values, European culture, there will be strife. I believe there will be, yeah. We've already reached that point. I believe so. I'm going to uh, ask a couple of questions that I hope have more uh, cheerful answers. I've learned, although I'm fairly uh, optimistic and cheerful person in private, when it comes to my Middle Eastern and Islamic career, it's a good career move to be pessimistic. It usually works out. All right. <clears throat> Israel, and once again, I'm quoting you directly. Nuclear annihilation, conventional military attacks, economic boycotts, demogra demographic overwhelming, ideological undermining, you name it, the threats to Israel are across the spectrum, close quote. A decade from now, will Israel be in a stronger position, a weaker position? or about the same as it is now as vis-a-vis -vis the Arab world? That's a tough one. Uh, if one were to extend... You do have a sense, though, that things are on, uh, things have to get better or they will get worse. This is the critical moment. I don't know. Uh, I, I see the Israeli body politic as lost, not having any idea what, what to That's do. what I don't understand. Here you the have... Deterrence, what, what, Israel, is the, what is the works. Jewish population of Israel now? Six million. Six million. People living under, nobody moves to Israel for the weather, right? Do, is it, is it actually not, not so bad. No, no, no. I don't mean to say <laughs> that the weather is, but, but the only possible reason to continue living in Israel is some sense of, of mission, some sense of participating in a great cause. Isn't True, that the case? True, but most of the is Jewish Israelis are not immigrants at this point. They're born there. It's, you know, it's And they just want to be like, they want normalcy. Is that it? Yeah, That's this, the great this, desire this, at this point? This is the emotion that surged to the front in the late 80s, early 90s. As the economy started to take off, the technological boom and the like, was a sense of, we're a Western state. We're the only Western state that has to assert its security on a daily basis that's being assaulted in all these different ways. Let's normalize. Let's get this to be like living elsewhere. And if that requires giving up territory, if it requires making other sorts of concessions, okay, do it, give it up. And 
earlier, I, I characterized that as appeasement. It, it works with, say, tribal leaders in Africa. That's what the British found in the 19th mm -hmm. century. It doesn't work with ideological uh, dictators such as Hitler or Brezhnev or Arafat. And that remains the dominant mindset or outlook well, in Israel Well, I, I can't say it has. Appeasement has been shown not to work. And that's why I call it loss, because deterrence is too difficult. No one wants to go back to that. Very, very few. And appeasement didn't work, so nobody really wants to go back to that, or not many. And so we're left with nothing. Daniel Pipes, thank you very much. Thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson of the Hoover Institution. Thanks for joining us.